Well, if yesterday's video was made in the hours preceding Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, today's video is made in the hours immediately after the end of her visit to Taiwan. Nancy Pelosi was in Taiwan for only a relatively short time. She did, however, meet with the Taiwanese president and with other Taiwanese officials. She expressed her personal support for Taiwan. She also indicated the United States' support for Taiwan. She spoke in a way that was clearly critical of China. She has now left Taiwan. Her aircraft has left Taiwan with, apparently, a Taiwanese fighter jet escort, and she is said to be on her way to South Korea, where, however, the South Korean president, who is on vacation, apparently has no plan to meet with her. Meanwhile, the Chinese, for their part, have wisely, in my opinion, done none of the things that some people speculated they might do. They did not shoot Nancy Pelosi's plane down. They did not try to intercept Nancy Pelosi's plane. They did not try to force Nancy Pelosi's plane to fly to China and take a prisoner there. I'm not sure, by the way, what they would, were supposed to do with Nancy Pelosi once she was forced to land in China. But anyway, they did not announce a blockade of Taiwan. And of course, they did not invade Taiwan or launch airstrikes on Taiwan or do any of those things that some people thought they might do. And I should say that there's been some comment about this. There's been various claims that the Chinese have been humiliated because they didn't respond in that kind of a way. All I would say is that no government should ever be criticised, in my opinion, for doing the right thing. It would have been entirely the wrong thing for the Chinese at this point in time to escalate this crisis even further by doing all of the things that I've just discussed. Uh, China is not ready for a war with the United States over Taiwan. And, of course, um, the economic and military consequences of such a war would have been awesome. So the Chinese acted with restraint and far from being ridiculed and criticised for doing so. It's better, I think, that people should be thankful that they did act without restraint. I'm going to add something else, by the way, that the Chinese themselves have never said, I mean, by this I mean the Chinese government, has never said or threatened to do any of the things that I've just talked about. They've never said that they would um, shoot down Pelosi's plane or force it to land in China or blockade Taiwan or invade Taiwan or do any of those things. Though they did promise a very strong reaction. And that strong reaction has begun, or at least is continuing. I think we're starting to see the first parts of it. And the, this involves, at the moment, massive war games in and around Taiwan by the Chinese People's Liberation Army. And the interesting thing about these war games is that Global Times has actually provided us with an explanation of what they are intended to do. And I'm taking this now from a Global Times article. Some drill zones are for the first time set to include areas within 12 nautical miles of the island of Taiwan. The, P the PLA, People's Liberation Army drills surrounding Taiwan are intended to show that the Chinese military is capable of blockading the entire island and of resolving the Taiwan question through no non-peaceful ways if the situation becomes irretrievable. From the designated Chinese military drill areas, the operations could pose a threat to major ports and shipping lanes in Taiwan, forming a complete blockade. This blockade style could be one of the actions taken in the future for achieving reunification by force, Hermann Shui, a retired Taiwan Lieutenant General, told Global Times on Wednesday. 
two northern exercise areas are designated by the Chinese People's Liberation Army and are located off the coast of Keelung Port and Taipei Port. The central area, exercise area, is located off Taichung Port, Chaichung Port. The southern exercise area is located off Kaohsiung Port and the eastern one is located off the Huailian port. The exercise areas are a template for locking down Taiwan, Shuai said. If the People's Liberation Army takes a long time, it will constitute a substantial blockade of Taiwan. The exercises are comprehensive and highly targeted showing the determination of resolving the Taiwan question once and for all, Chinese mainland military expert Sung Jinping told the Global Times on Wednesday. The drill, sh sh the exercises should be viewed as a war plan rehearsal. In the event of a future military conflict, it is likely that the operational plans currently being rehearsed will be directly translated into combat operations. It means that our battle plan has been made clear to the United States and Taiwan, the Taiwan authorities, and we are confident enough to inform them of the consequences of further provocation in this way. In other words, the Chinese are making it absolutely what, clear what they are doing. They are rehearsing a blockade of Taiwan. They are rehearsing missile exercises off the coast of all of Taiwan's ports. There's also reports that the Chinese Air Force is going to um, carry out exercises that would, be, would clearly signal a no-fly zone over Taiwan itself. And I would add that the vast assembly of ground troops that we've seen take on the Chinese mainland is clearly also intended to rehearse an outright um, invasion, an, an actual amphibious assault on Taiwan itself. So a blockade, an air exclusion zone, an invasion. And we're told by Global Times, the English language newspaper, owned by the People's Daily, the official newspaper of China's Communist Party, that this is our battle plan and we are rehearsing it. And that, it seems to me, is where we are. We are now in a situation where Nancy Pelosi has gone to Taiwan. She's uttered certain platitudes in support of Taiwan. I say platitudes because we've seen them, we've heard them all before. And of course, there was no reason for her to go to Taiwan to express them. But anyway, she's said these things that she wanted to say. She's gone to Taiwan itself and she's provoked a Chinese dress rehearsal of an air and see blockade of Taiwan and very likely a general invasion of Taiwan too. And we've also had a number of extremely strong statements by Chinese officials. And the important point about these statements is that they directly criticize the government of the United States. They make it crystal clear that the Chinese government does not consider that this is a personal initiative of Nancy Pelosi's and that the United States, the government of the United States, the administration of the United States is somehow not involved in this. And we've had statements, first of all, from the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi. And I'm going to read this in full. This is taken from the Chinese Foreign Ministry website. And I will read it and I'll quickly pass it. Though, as Chinese statements go, this is one that requires very little passing. Anyway, this is what Wang Yi 
said. In disregard of China's solemn representations, U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi brazenly went ahead with her visit to Taiwan, China's Taiwan region. The move seriously violates the One China principle, maliciously infringes on China's sovereignty, and blatantly engages in political provocations, which has aroused strong ind indignation amongst the Chinese people and widespread opposition from the international community. It proves once again that some US politicians have become troublemakers of US-China relations and that the United States, note the reference to the United States now, has become the biggest destroyer of peace across the Taiwan state, Strait and of regional stability. The United States should not dream of obstructing China's reunification. Taiwan is a part of China. The complete reunification of China is the trend of the times and an inevitability of history. We will leave no room for the Taiwan independence forces and external interference. No matter how the United States supports or connives at the Taiwan independence forces, it will all be in vain. The United States will only leave more ugly records of gross meddling in other countries' internal affairs in its history. The Taiwan question arose when the country, China, was weak and chaotic at the time, in the aftermath, in other words, of the Chinese Civil War of the 1930s and 1940s, and I would add of China's war with Japan, which is an extremely complicated and difficult war, which caused enormous damage and suffering to the Chinese people. Anyway, uh, 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 the article, uh, Wang Yi's statement after referring to that, says that it will surely end, the Taiwan question will surely end with national rejuvenation. Now notice this use of phrase, because when Wang Yi talks about national rejuvenation. He appears to say that that will happen once Taiwan has been reunited with the Chinese motherland, as he would say, the Chinese mainland. In other words, the process of China's national rejuvenation is incomplete and will re remain so up until the point is reached when China is fully reunited. And that explains, that is partially explains, why for China, for the Chinese government, and Wang Yi would say for the Chinese people, this project of the reunification of Taiwan to China is so important. Until this process of reunification is completed, the process of China's rejuvenation, its revival from the consequences of the century of humiliation which China experienced after it started to be attacked by the Western colonial powers and then eventually Japan from the 1830s and 1840s until China's, uh, uh, until the Communist Party's victory in the Chinese Civil War in 1949, that process of rejuvenation from that earlier period, that century of humiliation, will not be complete. So to continue, uh, the United States should not fantasize about undermining China's development and revitalization. China has found a correct development path in line with its own national conditions. Under the leadership of the Communist Party of China, 1.4 billion Chinese people are striding towards Chinese-style modernization. We put the development of our country and nation on the basis of our own strength and are willing to coexist peacefully and, to, and develop together with other countries. But we will never allow any country to undermine China's stability and development. So this, these comments directly relate U.S. actions with respect to Taiwan, U.S. encouragement of the Taiwan independence movement as an attempt to obstruct China's rejuvenation, 
its final recovery from the effects of that period, that century of um, humiliation, which ended in the 1940s. And it is also an attempt to obstruct China's development. And Wang Yi is again saying here that the reunification of China, the reunification of Taiwan with the Chinese mainland is indispensable. It is essential if that process of rejuvenation and recovery and of Chinese modernization is to be brought to its conclusion. So what Wang Yi is saying is that the United States is trying to obstruct that process of Chinese rejuvenation and economic modernization, and it's trying to do so by leveraging the problem of Taiwan. And the article, uh, the, sorry, Wang Yi then goes on to say, prov provoking on trouble on the Taiwan question in an attempt to ch delay China's development, undermine China's peaceful rise, will be totally futile and will surely lead to total failure. The United States should not fantasize about manipulating geopolitical games. Seeking peace, stability, development and win-win cooperation are the common aspirations of regional countries. So the United States is wasting its time it, if it thinks that it can draw other Pacific nations, the Philippines, Malaysia, uh, Singapore, Indonesia, all of those, into some kind of anti-Chinese alliance. It's not going to happen. Um, the introduction of the Taiwan question into the regional strategy of the United States, which inflates tensions and stokes confrontation, is against the trend of regional development and goes against the expectations of the people in the Asia-Pacific. This is very dangerous and stupid. The One China Principle has become a basic norm governing international relations and an integral part of the post-Second World War international order. What the United States should do is to immediately stop violating the purposes and principles of the United Nations Charter and stop playing the Taiwan card to disrupt the Asia-Pacific region. The United States should not fantasize about distorting facts at will. The United States side claimed that China is escalating the situation, but the basic facts are that the United States first provoked China on the Taiwan question and blatantly violated China's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Now notice that he is not saying here, Wang Yi is not saying this isn't just Pelosi, it is the United States that has blatantly violated China's sovereignty and territorial integrity. And it is the United States which is pursuing a coherent policy of trying to use Taiwan to isolate and destabilize China and obstruct its rise and development. And Pelosi's visit to Taiwan is a part of that. And then Wang Yi continues, the US side claimed that there was a president of the US House Speaker visiting Taiwan. Yet, the basic truth is that past mistakes cannot be used as an excuse to repeat them today. The US side claimed that it cannot restrain Congress due to the separation of powers. But the basic norm of international law is that the United States must fulfill its international obligations and key politicians should not be uh, misbehave. So China is not interested in this issue of the supposed separation of powers between Congress and the executive. As far as China is concerned, Pelosi is a senior US government official. The Congress is a part of the US government. She has gone to Taiwan. She's made the various statements that she has done over Taiwan. She's violated China's sovereignty, as the Chinese would say, and 
it is the entire government of the United States that bears the responsibility. Um, the Wang Yi then goes on to say it is also claimed that China's pursuit of reunification is a threat to Taiwan, but the basic logic is that Taiwan is an inalienable part of Chinese territory and the Taiwan question is purely an internal affair of China. It is lawful and justified that China upholds territorial integrity and opposes secession. Now, this, I think, is for many people the rub of the question, because I think a lot of people in the United States and elsewhere are saying, well, if the Taiwanese, Taiwanese people want to secede from, the, from China, shouldn't they be allowed to do so? The point to understand, the first point to understand, and there's a lot more to say here, but the first point to understand about this is that that is not the policy of the U the official policy of the government of the United States. The government of the United States has recognized Taiwan as an inalienable part of China. If the United States now turns around and says that it recognizes secession, it is of course going against that agreement which it arrived, it made with China, back in the 1970s when the United States opened diplomatic relations with China and, by the way, successfully enlisted China as a de facto ally against the Soviet Union at the end of the Cold War. But I would also suggest that it also would be violating principles, a principle of territorial integrity, which the United States, when it suits it, has insisted upon in other places. So the United States, for example, is supporting Ukraine's claim to its territorial integrity. It says that Ukraine is entitled to consider um, Crimea and Donbass part of its territory because the secession of these territories from Ukraine is supposedly illegal. And, of course, the United States, back in the 1860s, insisted on the territorial integrity of the United States and fought a huge war to protect, prevent the secession of the southern states. Now, I, I make that point. That's a legalistic, juridical point. And, of course, the United States has been happy to adopt other principles in other places. For example, it recognizes Kosovo's secession from Serbia, even though that arguably works against the territorial integrity of Serbia. So the United States is hardly consistent about this. I would like to just reiterate again that as of this moment in time, the United States is acting in a way that effectively denies Chinese sovereignty over Taiwan, whilst at the same time purportedly recognizing, recognizes Chinese sovereignty over Taiwan. It is playing a double game, and double games of this sort, in my experience, cause more damage and more mistrust and more ill feeling than a straightforward statement, uh, a, a straightforward policy of saying, say, supporting Taiwan, Taiwanese independence, which the United States might have consistently followed ever since Taiwan, in effect, separated itself from the Chinese mainland during the Chinese Civil War of the 1940s. So I just wanted to make that small point as I said, there's a lot more to be said about this issue, and I will come, come to it again later. And then um, Wang Yi goes on to say, I want to stress that the one Chinese China principle is the key stabilizing force for peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits. What Wang Yi is saying here is that up to this point, nobody 
there's never there's been no interest either from the Chinese side or from Taiwan's side in triggering a war because everybody accepted the one China policy, uh, at least in theory, even if Taiwan in practice went its own way. And the US acting in that fashion is now destabilizing that de facto arrangement. And then he goes on to say at, that it also uh, violates uh, 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 the, the three China-US joint communiques, which are the real guardrails for the peaceful coexistence between China and the United States. So what Wang Yi is saying is that the United States, by in effect inflaming the issue of Taiwan, is violating the agreements that China and the United States made back in the 1970s, which were the key mechanism for the rapprochement between these two countries. And that, of course, means that the peaceful coexistence between China and the United States is now in jeopardy. And then Wang Yi finishes, clinging to the, clinging to the United States to seek independence is a dead end. That's a warning to Taiwan and attempts to use the Taiwan question to contain China are doomed to failure. In the face of the great cause of national unification, the Chinese people have the courage not to be misled by fallacies or scared by evils, the ambition to never be intimidated or crushed, the determination to unite as one, and the ability to resolutely safeguard national sovereignty and national dignity. So this is, for the Chinese people, an existential issue over which they're all united. And there have been, inevitably, a series of supporting articles um, from um, Global Times, including uh, um, an important one whose title is US bears full responsibility for all consequences of Pelosi's Taiwan visit. And um, and um, it then um, uh, basically criticizes the whole uh, approach that the United States um, took. And then it goes on to say, this article, ignoring the consecutive stern warnings from the Chinese government over the trip, senior White House officials and US hawks continue hollowing out and blurring the one China principle, letting its domestic laws override international laws, coming up with a series of wrong concepts and claims about the Taiwan question, the most important and sensitive issue within China-US relations. The White House has lost the power of defining China-related policies, including those concerning Taiwan, to the Congress, reflecting the weakness and incapability of the administration and its latest promise to the Chinese government on the matter could be a slap in the face. Um, and uh, China, senior Chinese officials have been repeatedly warning about the grave consequences of the trip, not only on the cross-straits relations, but also on to China-US relations, which have already been deteriorating over the past few years due to Washington's mis misconceptions and misjudgment uh, uh, about Beijing. Um, US officials have been in taking increasingly bold actions to ho hollow out the US's one China policy and adopting a salami slicing approach to erode the principle. For, in, for instance, by removing the words on not supporting Taiwan independence in the US State Department's website section on relations with Taiwan in May, playing tricks to obscure the perception that China has the absolute sovereignty over the island and frequently hyping up false claims that Taiwan, the Taiwan Straits are international waters and sending lawmakers to visit the island. So, um, and, uh, so what the Chinese are saying is that Pelosi's trip 
to Taiwan, far from being the isolated actions of a rogue individual, are consistent with the policies of the United States government, of the White House, of the Biden administration, which for some time now has been st have been steadily working towards eroding the chi one China principle and preparing the day for the US recognition of Taiwan's independence. So here we are. What has the United States achieved or rather what has Nancy Pelosi achieved by her visit to Taiwan? What she has done all that she has done is, as we see from these statements by Wang Yi, by Global Times, um, through all of these vast military exercises, what she has done is convince China of two things. Firstly, that the United States is hostile to China and is seeking, is sees China as an adversary and wants to stop China's development. And the second is that the United States intends at some point to recognize Taiwan as an independent country, something which the Chinese consider an existential issue, something which goes completely against the entire flow of Chinese policy ever since the establishment of the Chinese People's Republic in the 1940s, something which would be massively destabilizing for China were it ever to take place, and an issue therefore which the Chinese consider to be existential. And in light of this, China, having decided that the United States is an adversary, having decided also that the China that the United States eventually intends to recognize Taiwan's independence, it is now actively preparing and openly rehearsing for an armed blockade and ultimate invasion of Taiwan. And we can be certain that from this moment on, this is going to be the main focus of Chinese policy. I say the main focus to the exclusion of all but else. <laughs> Briefly, Wang Yi has said that this is existential, that reuniting Taiwan with the mainland is the essential precondition for the completion of the process of China's rejuvenation and modernization. It must therefore happen. It is therefore an existential issue and China will see it through. And it would see it through if necessary, as we have seen with these exercises by military means. Now, I can't see how achieving this is in the interests of the United States. Whether the United States realizes it or not, whether Nancy Pelosi understands it or not, the United States is now in open conflict with China over Taiwan. Open conflict is what China is now straightforwardly saying, and it faces a huge Chinese military buildup, driven based on China's colossal industrial and technological capacity, as China bends all its forces, all its, uh, uh, all its uh, machinery, its uh, factories, its uh, engineers, its scientists, towards the objective of recovering Taiwan. So we're going to see a major build-up in Chinese nuclear, nuclear missile, nuclear arsenal. We're going to see uh, a further enlargement of the Chinese Navy. We're going to see the China building more hypersonic missiles with a view to um, attacking US Navy carriers. And we are undoubtedly going to see a major stepping up of China's development of its submarine force, the area where arguably China is at its weakest. And of course, something else as well, China is now going to be looking for allies. 
allies in this conflict with the United States. And the obvious ally it's going to look towards is, of course, Russia, which has now openly and loudly stated its support for China over this issue. And the support that the Russians can provide is obviously in terms of raw materials, oil, gas, wheat, coal, uh, 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 metals, all the various things that a modern economy needs to keep functioning and which the Chinese would need in the event that they were to face uh, a, a naval blockade imposed on them by the US Navy. And of course, the Chinese are also inevitably going to be interested in some US, in some Russian technologies, hypersonic missile technologies, quite possibly, but also submarine technologies, very likely. The Russians are on a par with the US Navy, or roughly on a par with the US Navy in submarines. China is not. China will undoubtedly be coming to Russia for help and advice on how to develop submarines as quiet and as powerful as those that Russia has and as uh, and capable of taking on the US Navy submarine force. So that has further implications because if China now needs Russia, that means that the Russians can now rely on China. Now, bear in mind that the United States is currently trying to get customers of Russian oil to agree to a price cap on the oil they buy from the Russians. Now, that was not, never, in my opinion, a remotely workable idea. The Indians don't seem to be interested. The Chinese have been negative. What chance is there now of that idea ever being seen through, of this ever actually happening? The United States has been trying to get the Chinese to restrict high technology exports, microchips first and foremost, to Russia, undermining, because that would undermine the US's own sanctions, the West sanctions, um, on the export of high technology, uh, primarily chips, to Russia. Why would the Chinese now um, want to comply with that American demand? Surely now the Chinese have an overwhelming incentive, since they need Russia, to ensure that Russia has all the high-end microchips that it needs. So the whole sanctions policy against Russia, sagging already, going nowhere very far, has now, it seems to me, been blown out of the water. I have to say that I feel deeply depressed about this whole affair. Now, again, I do understand that there is a lot of sympathy for Taiwan in the United States. And there's a lot of people in the United States who don't like the Chinese government. And there's an awful lot of people in the United States who feel that Taiwan is entitled to its independence from a government that most Taiwanese people don't like. But that begs the question, what is the United States in the end prepared to do in order to prevent China eventually absorbing or taking over Taiwan? Is the United States prepared to go to war with China? Because given the tenor of Chinese statements, given the actions that the Chinese are taking, given the immense resources that the Chinese are now going to throw at this problem, that is probably what the logic of opposing Taiwan's um, annexation, if you like, conquest if you prefer, reunification as the Chinese would say, with China, it, would, it might need a war between the United States and China to prevent it. I say that because war between China and Taiwan is now likely coming. I, if the government in Taipei decides that it can rely now 
on a US guarantee and forge ahead with independence, then at some point China will respond. It will take it will take a military action. It's already said that it has the capability to impose a blockade on Taiwan and it would no doubt do so and further down the line it might actually as I said pursue an outright invasion of Taiwan. So is the United States in that kind of situation prepared to get into conflict with the Chinese is it prepared to break a sea blockade? Is it prepared to break an air blockade? Is it prepared to get itself drawn into a confrontation with a nuclear superpower with an industrial base far greater than its own, backed by the most the, the, the another nuclear superpower, Russia, which actually has more nuclear weapons than the United States it does itself. If the answer is yes, then is that something that has been properly conveyed and discussed within the United States amongst the American people? Have they given their consent to it? If no, then Taiwan is being taken for a ride. Because if the United States is not prepared to come to Taiwan's rescue. If China attacks Taiwan or blockades Taiwan or does any of the things that China is now rehearsing for, well then in that case Taiwan has been given encouragement by the United States to pursue an independence course where with encouragement which will never be fulfilled through any practical action. Those of us who have been following the situation with respect to Ukraine can see the parallels. Ukraine has been encouraged to seek NATO membership. It has been encouraged to obstruct implementation of the Minsk Agreement. And the result has been a war in Ukraine, which Ukraine is now losing, which is causing the deaths of thousands of people and which is very likely going to end in the destruction of Ukraine. And the same, it looks to be the future of Taiwan if the United States is not prepared to follow through on the statements that people like Nancy Pelosi have made. So there we are. We are in a crisis. This is now a train wreck. We can see the trains hurtling towards each other. Um, I have to say that it looks incredibly bleak to me. I don't think that anybody in the United States is going to listen to what Wang Yi is saying. I think on the contrary, there's going to be all sorts of people who are probably pleased with themselves because, as they see it, China has been humiliated. Though, what practical effect that has, I can't really see. And as I said, we are therefore now on a trajectory towards war with, between Taiwan and China and the potential for a conflict, an armed conflict, between China and the United States has been increased to extraordinary levels. And of course, if this Chinese build-up, which we're now going to see, leads other countries in the Pacific, like Japan and perhaps South Korea, to start contemplating uh, acquiring nuclear capabilities, the nuclear non-proliferation system, which is also crumbling, will surely collapse as well. And I cannot for the life of me see how that is in the interests of the United States. Anyway, that's where we are. Good work, if you like, from Nancy Pelosi. Um, a short trip, possibly. Um, Eve Smith of Naked Capitalism suggested 
um, on a programme that I did, a roundtable I did on Gonzalo Lira's second channel. Uh, Eve Smith has suggested that um, Pelosi was acting principally because of the needs, the electoral needs in her congressional district, something which I'm perfectly willing to believe. If so, then she hasn't, it seems to me, weighed out the consequences. Perhaps given her age and other issues, perhaps she's not capable of doing so. I would add, by the way, and finally on this issue of Taiwan, that we're getting more and more information about this disastrous telephone conversation between Xi Jinping and Joe Biden. It seems that the purpose of the call, which was initiated by the United States, was to reassure the Chinese, reassure Xi Jinping, that Pelosi was going to Taiwan on her private initiative. But the effect was completely undercut by what apparently was an incredibly hectoring, almost bullying term towards Xi Jinping, adopted by the President of the United States, President Biden. Now, I'm not, I wasn't party to the call, I wasn't listening in. I don't know whether that is true or not, but I'm afraid I think it probably is true. If it is true, then all I will say is that those whom the gods destroy, they most emphatically, in this case, have made mad. Now, this is the crisis over Taiwan that we're now talking about. I'm going to do a second brief video on the subject of Ukraine, the Ukraine update. Um, it seems to me that this issue of Taiwan required its own programme. And um, this is the completion of the video, but I will be doing a Ukraine update very briefly. Well, thank you for joining me again for this programme. I look forward to you joining me again in future programmes on this channel. Remember, you can find us on other platforms, Locals, Rumble, uh, um, um, Odyssey, and um, also Telegram. Also, please remember that you can support us via Patreon and Subscribestar. And last but not least, remember that you can go to our shop buying the great things that you will see there. And also, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription from this channel. Thank you for joining me again today. More from me soon.